Lads and ladies, welcome to the Junior Classics. Hi there, I'm Sir Bradley Hassey, a teller of borrowed tales. Join me as I share stories of courage, adventure, and wonder. But don't take my word for it. You can find out for yourself on today's Junior Classic. Hello there, Junior Scholars. My name is Sir Bradley Hassey, guardian of the written word and your guide through the Junior Classics. Our mission is to inspire children with a love of good reading and a real and lasting interest in Western literature, history, and scholarship. If this is your first time listening, thank you for joining us, and a very special thank you to my loyal listeners who tune in each and every episode. Last week, we explored the story of Tom Thumb, and learned why behaving like a smart boy is a bad thing. If that sounds odd to you, then go back and listen to the story. This week's story is called Bluebeard by Charles Perrault. Like most of our other tales, there are multiple versions of the tale, and this happens to be the most popular. Now I need to warn you, this could be considered a scary tale. There are a few intense scenes, nothing extreme, but this story may not be suitable for the very young. So kids, if you are listening on your own right now, do Sir Bradley a solid and ask your parents if it's okay to listen to a scary story. I read this to my five-year-old boy and he thought it a little scary at the time, but he was not scarred. And there is a happy ending with a message of hope and rescue to smooth things over. But before we get to the story, lost and found words. Listen carefully to the meaning of these words and try and spot them during the story. Our first word is obliged. Obliged means to feel that it is necessary to do something or being forced to do something. If someone shares something with you, you would be obliged to share something with them. Our next word is repentance. This means to feel bad for wrongdoing and to choose to turn away from the wrong behavior in the future. Another way of thinking about repentance is to turn from evil and to turn towards what is good. Our third word is afflicted. Afflicted means to be greatly troubled, often by a disease or sickness. Healers provide comfort to the afflicted. And our last word is mirth. This should be a familiar word for you since we covered it last week but repetition is key. Mirth means amusement, cheerfulness, or laughter. So, a very funny joke would cause much mirth. Now, on to the show. I'm going to provide some background before we read the tale. The main character is called Bluebeard because he has, well, a Bluebeard. Bluebeard is a nobleman who has been married several times to women who have all mysteriously disappeared. Bluebeard visits his neighbor and asks to marry one of his children. The girls think his Bluebeard is horrifying and get their younger sister to marry him. After hosting a wonderful party, Bluebeard persuades her to marry him, which she does. Bluebeard then announces that he must go away for a time and gives the keys of the house to his wife. Bluebeard tells her, she may open any door in the house with them, which each contains his riches, but specifically forbids her from entering one small room. He warns her if she decides to enter this room, she will face a terrible consequence. Oh man, what do you think? Will she enter the room or not? Only one way to find out. By Charles Perrault. There was once a man who had fine houses, both in town and country, a deal of silver and gold plate, embroidered furniture, and coaches gilded all over with gold. But this man was so unlucky as to have a blue beard, which made him so ugly that all the women and girls ran away from him. One of his neighbors, a lady of quality, had two daughters who were perfect beauties. He asked her for one of them in marriage, 
but neither of them could bear the thought of marrying a man who had a blue beard. Besides, he had already been married several times, and nobody ever knew what became of his wives. In the hope of making them like him, Bluebeard took them, with their mother and three or four ladies of their acquaintance, and other young people of the neighborhood, to one of his country houses, where they stayed a whole week. There were parties of pleasure, hunting, fishing, dancing, mirth, and feasting all the time. Nobody went to bed, but all passed the time in merrymaking and joking with one another. Everything succeeded so well that the youngest daughter began to think the master of the house was a very civil gentleman, and his beard might not be so very blue after all. As soon as they returned home, the marriage took place. About a month afterward, Bluebeard told his wife that he was obliged to take a journey for six weeks, about affairs of great consequence, desiring her to amuse herself in his absence, to send for her friends and acquaintances, to carry them into the country if she pleased, and to have a good time wherever she was. To his wife, Bluebeard said, Here are the keys of the two great wardrobes, wherein I have my best furniture. These are of my silver and gold plate, which is not every day in use. These open my strong boxes, which hold my money, both gold and silver. These my caskets of jewels, and this is the master key to all my apartments. Now this little one here is the key of the closet at the end of the great gallery on the ground floor. Open them all. Go into all and every one of them, except that little closet, which I forbid you. If you happen to open it, there's nothing but what you may expect from my just anger and resentment. She promised to observe exactly whatever he ordered, so having embraced her, he got into his coach and proceeded on his journey. Her neighbors and good friends did not wait to be sent for, so great was their impatience to see all the rich furniture of the house. They ran through all the rooms, closets, and wardrobes, which were all so fine and rich that they seemed to surpass one another. After that, they went up into the two great rooms, where were the best and richest furniture. They could not sufficiently admire the number and beauty of the tapestries, beds, couches, cabinets, stands, tables, and looking glasses, in which you might see yourself from head to foot. Some of them were framed with glass, others with silver, plain and gilded, the finest and most magnificent ever seen. They ceased not to compliment and envy their friend, but she was so much pressed by her curiosity to open the closet on the ground floor that without considering that it was very uncivil to leave her company, she went down to a little back staircase with such haste that she had twice or thrice liked to have broken her neck. Arriving at the closet door, she hesitated, thinking of her husband's orders and considering what unhappiness might attend her if she was disobedient. But the temptation was so strong, she could not overcome it. She took the little key and opened it, trembling, but could not at first see anything plainly because the windows were shut. After some moments, she began to perceive that the floor was all covered with blood, in which lay the bodies of several dead women, ranged against the walls. These were the wives whom Bloombeard had married, and murdered, one after another. She thought she would die for fear, and the key, which she pulled out of the lock, fell out of her hand. After having somewhat recovered from the shock, she took up the key, locked the door, and went upstairs to her bedroom to rest. Having observed that the key of the closet was stained with blood, she tried two or three times to wipe it off, but the stain would not come out. In vain did she wash it, and even rub it with soap and sand. The blood still remained, for the key was magical. When the blood was removed from one side, it came again on the other. Bluebeard returned from his journey the same evening, and said he'd received letters upon the road informing him that the affair he went about was ended to his advantage. His wife did all she could do to convince him she was extremely glad of his speedy return. Next morning he asked her for the keys, which she gave him but with such a trembling hand that he easily guessed what had happened. What? Is not the key of my closet among the rest? I must certainly have left it above upon the table. Fail not. 
to bring it to me presently. After several goings backward and forward, she was forced to bring him the key. Bluebeard attentively considered it and said to his wife, How comes this blood upon the key? I do not know, cried the poor woman, paler than death. You do not know? I know very well. You were resolved to go into the closet, were you not? Very well, madam. You shall go in and take your place among the ladies you saw there. Upon this, she threw herself at her husband's feet and begged his pardon with all the signs of true repentance, vowing that she would never again be disobedient. She would have melted a rock, so beautiful and sorrowful was she. But Bluebeard had a heart harder than any rock. You must die, madam, and that very soon. Since I must die, give me some little time to say my prayers. I give you half a quarter of an hour, but not one moment more. When she was alone, she called out to her sister. Sister Anne, go up. I beg you on top of the tower and see if my brothers are not coming. They promised me that they would come today, and if you see them, give them a sign to make haste. Sister Anne went up on the top of the tower and the poor afflicted wife cried out from time to time, Anne, Sister Anne, do you see anyone coming? I see nothing but the sun, which makes a dust, and the grass, which looks green. In the meanwhile, Bluebeard, holding a great saber in his hand, cried out as loud as he could bawl to his wife, Come down instantly, or I shall come up after you. One moment longer, if you please. Anne, Sister Anne, dost thou see anybody coming? I see nothing but the sun which makes a dust and the grass which looks green. Come down quickly, or I will come up after you. I am coming. Anne, Sister Anne, dost thou not see anyone coming? I see a great dust which comes on the side. Are they my brothers? Alas, no, my dear sister, I see a flock of sheep. Will you not come down? One moment longer. Anne, Sister Anne! Dost thou see nobody coming? I see two horsemen, but they are yet a great way off. God be praised, they are my brothers. I will make them a sign as well as I can for them to make haste. Then Bluebeard bawled out so loud that he made the whole house tremble. The distressed wife came down and threw herself at his feet, all in tears, with her hair about her shoulders. That will not help you. You must die. Then taking hold of her hair with one hand and lifting up the sword with the other, he was going to cut off her head. The poor lady, turning to him and looking at him with dying eyes, begged him to give her one little moment more. No, no, say your prayers, and was just about to strike. At this very instant, there was such a loud knocking at the gate that Bluebeard looked up in alarm. The gate was opened, and two horsemen entered who drew their swords and ran directly at Bluebeard. He knew them to be his wife's brothers, one a dragoon, the other a musketeer, so that he quickly ran to save himself. But the two brothers pursued so close that they overtook him before he could get to the steps of the porch and ran their swords through his body and left him dead. The poor wife was almost as dead as her husband and had not strength enough to rise and welcome her brothers. Bluebeard had no heirs, and so his wife became mistress of all his estate. She made use of one part of it to marry her sister Anne to a young gentleman who had loved her a long while, another part to buy captain's commissions for her brothers, and the rest to marry herself to a very worthy gentleman, who made her forget the unhappy time she had passed with Bluebeard. The End That story was pretty intense, and I almost decided to skip it, but I reflected on my mission, which is to edify your mind and spirit by teaching what is good, beautiful, and true. What is true is that bad things happen to good people, and it can be scary. What is good is that there are many good men who are willing to go into harm's way in order to protect others. I have two more lost and found words for you. Do you remember the brothers of Bluebeard's wife? They were both soldiers, one a dragoon and the other 
a musketeer. A dragoon was a soldier who was trained to fight on and off horseback, and a musketeer was an early modern soldier whose primary weapon was a musket, an early version of the rifle. These two warriors rushed to their sister's aid and saved her from doom. Now for the beautiful part of the story. Bluebeard's wife and sister Anne were in a terrible situation, but they did not despair. Despair means to have an utter loss of hope or no hope at all. You feel doomed like nothing can save you. Bluebeard's wife did not despair. I think she handled the situation pretty well, all things considered. She knew her brothers were riding fast, and they were strong, armed, and trained. She had hope that they would save her, and indeed they did. The beautiful lesson is this, junior scholars. You may find yourself in a terrible situation. You may be scared and completely unsure of what to do, but you always have hope. Hope and rescue. You have hope and rescue because Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, has already won the battle against evil and the bluebeards of this world. So do not despair. Be steadfast and strong. I am Sir Bradley Hassey. As always, be brave, be loyal, and speak the truth. Now for you parents out there, I want you to understand why we are doing this, what we are trying to achieve, and how you can help us. This is a rescue operation to preserve the classics and the wisdom within before it is lost forever. Our goal is to inspire children with a love of good reading by safeguarding and breathing new life into the greatest stories in history and empower you, the parents, with a resource you can trust to enrich your child's mind and spirit. We don't want these stories and the wisdom within to be forgotten so our children don't have to learn these lessons on their own. The most important thing you can do for us is to spread the message and tell others about these stories and what we are doing. If you want to donate, we would love that as well. My promise is that 100% of donations will go to building the impact and quality of the Junior Classics. If you have feedback and thoughts on how we can do things better, please send an email to thejuniorclassics at gmail.com. Thank you for listening.